is Eric Jacobson. I'm the uh, CEO of Battle Franklin Trust, which manages this house as well as Carnton, where we'll be going next. But just a few things inside the house, just to give everyone some context about um, where we are specifically, not the town, obviously, you know, we're in Franklin. But this is the Carter House. And this area would become a huge focal point on November 30th, 1864. And I begin to relate what happens um, this day, and we'll, once we get outside, we'll talk about the days leading up to this. Um, a, a lot of this will come into some perhaps better clarity in how this ties into the Minnesota story, which takes place two weeks later at the Battle of Nashville. This house was built in 1829. Um, the family that lived here moved in about 1830. The fellow who built it, Fountain Branch Carter, and his wife Polly, you'll see them when we get across the hallway. Um, over the course of their marriage had 12 children, so let me assure you, this house was filled with people. If you think we're crammed in here, there were a lot of people in this house throughout many years. The farm itself ended up being about 300 acres, like a lot of farmers in the area. It was growing corn and grain, raised hogs, cattle and sheep. This is not cotton country, although he did start growing some cotton in the 1850s. Um, it was really a livestock operation for a number of decades. There were 28 slaves here when the Civil War broke out. And Franklin was a small town, about 750 people. And there had been a lot of troop movement through this area in the first few years of the war, but no major battles. In fact, the closest major engagement that was at Murfreesboro, <coughs> two years before the Battle of Franklin, of course, the Battle of Shiloh had been in 1862, but that is even further out to the southwest. So Franklin had, had seen some effects of the war, but nothing like what they would experience on Wednesday, November 30th. And for those of you who, were all of you at the state event this morning, or some of you there, just a few of you? <coughs> I, I gave some comments about the importance of just the war as a whole, um, but really that what happens here is very, very important and, and had long been ignored. This is a great room as far as the story goes, because when we get outside, just remember what happens in here. This house becomes headquarters for the 23rd U.S. Army Corps. And it was in this room that the fellow whose image you might see in the case over there, Brigadier General Jacob Cox, arrives here at 4.30 in the morning and establishes the Carter House as his headquarters, and the U.S. Army begins setting up a defensive perimeter on the south edge of town. And we'll get back to that story in a bit. But what happens in this room throughout the morning is there's a lot of activity in and out of here as the, as the U.S. Army begins to array itself um, some point late that morning, early that afternoon, Fountain Branch Carter, who had called this home for nearly 35 years, came to Jacob Cox, almost certainly in this room with his son, um, Fountain Branch's son. His oldest son was named Moscow. And they asked General Cox, what should they do? They didn't just have themselves to worry about. Also present in the house, Moscow, like his father, was a widower. He had four children. Three of Moscow's sisters lived here. Two of them have children. A sister-in-law lived here, and she had children. There were 17 people living in this house at the time, and about a dozen of them were under the age of 12. And there's really nowhere to go. You can't go that way. The U.S. Army is establishing a bridge yet. Their plan was to evacuate Franklin. You can't go that way because the river winds its way around on that side of town. There's nothing out there. And there's really just nowhere to go. So they asked him what should they do. And he advised them that he didn't think there was going to be a battle. It was getting to be late in the day. And he told them their plan was to evacuate. And so he suggested that they stay unless a battle was imminent. Because as he said, I can't guarantee if you leave the contents of the house of the house itself. And so they decided to stay, which certainly was a very fateful decision for them because what would unfold in the next few hours would consume their very existence. The battle would wash over the farm, it would surround the house, and would swirl around here for hours. Meanwhile, the Carters were in the basement, in the room right beneath us, as this awful conflict would tear apart the south side of this town. 
How many of you have been here before to Franklin or visited? So a few of you have been, but, but the vast majority have not. I, I don't know that I said this this morning. I believe that this, this campaign, which of course culminates on the hills outside of Nashville, is the greatest story of the Civil War. I don't believe there's anything like it. There are no other Civil War sites of this significance in the country where you get to do what you're doing right now, which is to walk inside the home of a family that lived here. And you won't get to see just one, you'll get to see two. And there are three homes in town. The Lodes family lived kind of kitty corner across the street. You don't get this anywhere else. The battlefield, once thought lost, we have begun to reclaim. Almost 150 acres of the battlefield have been saved in the last decade at the cost of about $11 million. Most of it privately raised. We have worked diligently to save what we can and to restore this story to its proper place. But I do believe it is the greatest story of the war. In some reasons, for what I talked about this morning, this was a violent affair. The romance was long gone by the time this battle was fought. By the time the fall of 1864 rolled around, there were almost 600,000 dead. And no one knew when the war was going to end. And we were on the edge of destroying ourselves. Someone, when we started using that, uh, that line as a marketing term, you know, you get all these really brilliant people in a room that will tell you what you should do and what you shouldn't do. And then there was someone like me who's like, no, I think we should use this. <clears throat> and the marketing person said, well, how do you know it's the greatest story of the Civil War? I said, well, I know it because it is. And he said, well, how can you prove that? It's subjective. I said, that's the point. P.T. Barnum said it was the greatest show on earth. Did anybody prove him wrong? <laughs> this is the greatest story of the war. This is not Manassas. It's not Antietam. It's not Gettysburg. It's not the first half of the war. It's not the midpoint of the war. It's the violent conclusion of this war. This is when the fighting seemed to almost escalate. The closer we got to the end, the nastier the combat got. And the casualties just mounted. And no one who was here in the fall of 1864, whether they be from Minnesota or Texas, they didn't know it would be over in April. They'd heard a lot of promises that it might be over by Christmas of 62. It might be over after a few battles in 61. Then it was going to be over by the end of 63. And then Lincoln's hanging on trying to get reelected to a second term. He wasn't even sure he was going to be reelected. The South is beginning to crumble. Soldiers are deserting southern armies left and right. Those left are the hardcore fighters, the ones I described this morning, who described themselves as martyrs willing to die. There's great dissent in the north. Huge anti-war movements. The country was falling apart. And in a little place called Franklin, and then ultimately Nashville, you would see the last great chapters of this war play out. So that sort of um, kind of a general introduction to the house We'll go across the hall, let you see the Carter family close up, and then we're going to go outside and talk about what happened here on the last day of November 1864. So we're going to switch with this group. So if you want to head out that door, we're going to go right through the door across the hall and just alternate with that group. And I was actually one of those kids. When I took those tours, I was actually paying attention. I was actually interested. Um, it wasn't just, you know, a day out of school to do whatever, you know, run around, and jump, and be free. I was actually interested in this. I was the same when they used to, we went to a, like a mummy exhibit one time in, in either Minneapolis or St. Paul when I was growing up, and I was really into that too. So I was always interested in that sort of weird stuff. And then I, as I got older, I don't even remember when it was. I, I probably wasn't, but 9, 10, 11 years old. I had first heard this story about a man in the ninth Minnesota. I had no ancestors um, who were here at the time of the war. My family all came here 20 years later. So I started hearing these stories about this man in the 9th Minnesota, whose, his name, whose name was about as proverbial Minnesota as one could get, Ed Peterson. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> and I found out that the, that the 9th had, uh, they had fought at Rice's Crossroads, and then they were at Tupelo, and then ended up in Missouri chasing Sterling Price all over with the 16th Corps, and then ended up in Nashville fighting on Shy's Hill. And the connection to Peterson was that he had 
homesteaded the farm. I grew up on a dairy farm. He had homesteaded the farm on which I was raised. The son lost the farm in the Depression, and my grandfather bought it from the state uh, at an auction. So that was the connection. Ed Peterson's house um, was a tractor shed for my grandfather. It was this little, tiny building that I don't think it was the size of this room. And that's where he had lived for about 15, 20 years at the end of his life. And I'd seen photographs of this man. He's buried not far from where my grandparents are buried. He lived until 1927. My third grade teacher remembered him from when she was a little girl. So I had this connection to this veteran. I had no blood connection, but he was the closest thing to I, that I had to, you know, really, I guess what you'd say is an ancestral connection. He was connected to my family in, you know, a proxy sort of way. And I heard stories about him that as a man late in life, he would show up at county fairs and he would run these, you know, 40, 50 yard sprints. He was doing this in his 70s or 80s. And I thought, as you often hear these stories, this has got to be just nonsense. It's not possible. And to this day, I couldn't tell you whether they were just old stories or whether it happened. But I will tell you that when I first went to Bryce's Crossroads, which was the ninth's first real major action, about three quarters of his company was captured at Bryce's Crossroads. And I got to thinking, maybe he could run really <laughs> fast. <laughs> because it's probably the only thing that saved about half the regiment that day, in July 1864, when it was caved in. Um, and a lot of those guys went on to die at Andersonville. But then I came to Tennessee, and I went to Nashville, and traipsed all around that ground, and then ended up here. And this campaign really had been forgotten. And I came here about a decade ago. I wrote a book on Spring Hill and Franklin. I did not cover Nashville. I might one day write about it. I know enough about Nashville to be probably incredibly dangerous. But Nashville is a separate, it's a separate animal. It's really a different part of the same campaign. This 24-hour running stretch from Spring Hill to Franklin would really set the tone for the campaign and would lead ultimately to U.S. victory and the Confederate demise on the 15th and 16th of December on the outskirts of Nashville. So why does any of this happen? Why does any of this matter? Why was this taking place in late 1864? I ask groups this all the time. What's the objective? What are these two armies aiming for? Why are they moving through Middle Tennessee this late in the war? It's a one word answer. What are they aiming for? No, uh uh. Freedom? Well, yes, but that's not the answer. It's a military objective. It's Nashville. That's what the Confederates are trying to take back. Tennessee was the last state to join the Confederacy. Nashville was the first Confederate capital to fall to US troops. That had happened early in the war. Now it's late. So what's the benefit of Nashville to the Northern War effort? I'm getting into all this because when we get into the combat, it's going to make a lot more sense why this battle happened and why it's important to remember. What's important about Nashville? Why do Northern why are northern troops desperate to hold on to Nashville? What's its importance? Trains. Trains? Logistics. Logistics. There's one other thing. Supplies. Supplies. Yeah. And one other thing related to supplies. Uh-huh. River. The Cumberland River. The Cumberland attaches to... See, you didn't think you were going to get a geography lesson, did you? <laughs> the Ohio. And what does the Ohio connect to? The Mississippi. The Mississippi. And the trains all come through central Tennessee. Anything you were going to ship down out of Detroit and Chicago and Louisville and Cincinnati had to come down, unless you were going to ship it down the Mississippi, had to come down the trains through Nashville and could also be shipped down via the Cumberland. Nashville has become a supply and logistical hub. It is critically important to the Northern War effort. And now it is very late 
and John Bell Hood, who is in command of the beleaguered Confederate Army, which has just lost Atlanta in September, believes the only way to drag the war out is to move back into Tennessee. Trying to stop whatever William Sherman was going to do next wasn't going to accomplish anything. So Hood came roaring out of Georgia across North Alabama and into Middle Tennessee with over 30,000 men. His objective, lay siege to and take Nashville. Nashville was only defended by 8,000 soldiers. These are post and garrison troops. These are not frontline fighters. George Henry Thomas was shipped back to begin putting together a defense in Nashville. One of the first things he asks for is A.J. Smith's 16th Corps, which is in Missouri. And then Sterling Price comes out of Arkansas, moves into Missouri, and Price ends up pursuing, or rather, Smith ends up pursuing Price all the way across the state out to Kansas City, and lots of Minnesota troops on that excursion, and that is taking away desperate time that George Henry Thomas does not have a lot of. The 4th and the 23rd Corps were detached from Sherman's army, shipped back here to help defend Nashville. They were posted 60 miles due south of here, near Pulaski, Tennessee, not far from the Alabama border. Their job was to monitor the Confederate movements out of Alabama. Thomas is desperately trying to get enough troops put together in the capital to hold Hood back because there's no guarantees about what might happen out here to the south. How close is Hood at that time? Hood is about 40 miles away from Schofield, so he's 100 miles from here. John Schofield is in command of the U.S. troops who were placed at Pulaski. He knew Hood. They'd gone to school together at West Point, graduated in the same class. What a couple of characters they were. 33 years old in the summer and fall of 1864. Both had ended up four demerits short of expulsion from West Point, <laughs> which is not altogether uncommon. So don't think that's a flaw in their character, because it's not. Not everybody can be Robert E. Lee and be that, that boring. Stiff. <laughs> Hood got busted for all the things young boys do. Smoking, his hair was too long, showed up late for revelry. Schofield got busted running a poker ring. All the things boys tend to do. They both graduated. They both went on to careers in the U.S. Army. Now they're on opposing sides. Schofield's job was to hold Hood back. Stalin. Delay. Let Thomas get the reinforcements together in Nashville. Thomas is banging on the telegraph wires every single day to try and get A.J. Smith out of Missouri. Smith finally begins making his way, but it's going to take days, and here comes Hood. This is a desperate Confederate army. Someone years ago said to me, my great-great-grandfather might have been illiterate, but he wasn't stupid. The southern troops knew the stakes were very high, and so did the U.S. troops opposing them. Many of these U.S. soldiers had spent two and a half years fighting from Nashville to Murfreesboro to Chattanooga to Atlanta, and in five weeks they were almost backed up to the gates of Nashville. They understood the stakes. They had to stop Hood's army. Hopefully you're beginning to see why this really did matter and why it deserved a fate better than it had for the last many, many decades, which was to have been ignored. To understand how our Civil War ended is to come right through this area. <clears throat> it may have ended at Appomattox and in North Carolina, but those were the surrenders. The last great battles were out here. John Schofield evacuates Pulaski, pulls his army up to Columbia, which is 30 miles south of here. Hood tries to flank him again. He nearly cut him off at a little place called Spring Hill, just a dozen miles down the road. It was a brilliant move by the Confederates but it was a brilliant move that was not completed. And on the night of November 29th, the U.S. Army escaped, slipped away from the Confederate grasp. Think about this. The U.S. troops, on the night of November 29th, marched 30 miles in 15 hours. When you get back home, give that a shot someday. <laughs> 25,000 U.S. troops moving right up this road from the south. 25,000 troops, 800 supply wagons, six to 7,000 horses and mules, and 60 pieces of artillery. It is an incredible feat. And when the U.S. Army began to arrive on the outskirts of this small little town, 
Their plan was to continue straight on to Nashville. Schofield had had enough of all this parlaying out in the open. But when he got here and Jacob Cox stopped here to set up headquarters, Schofield headed down toward the bridgehead to try and find out what the condition of the bridges were. And the news wasn't good. The Harpeth River was not passable. There was a rail bridge there, but that's a trestle. You can't cross anything on a trestle, so they had to plank that bridge. The other bridge was completely out, so the engineers got to work. You know, these engineers, they love to build things and then tear them down later on. So they got to work repairing the other bridge. You've got a lot of stuff to get across the bridge, so that's going to take hours to rebuild them and hours to move everything to the north side to evacuate and move to Nashville. Thus, Jacob Cox was given the job of setting up a defensive perimeter on the south edge of town. And the U.S. Army begins to unwind. By noon, there were 15,000 U.S. troops in place. Cox's own division from the road east, Tom Ruger's division just south of here, wraps around the hill, Nathan Kimball's division out to the northwest. There are 750 people in this town who've probably never seen 15,000 men in their lives. Now the whole south edge of their community is being ripped apart. A defensive line, earthworks, three, four feet high. One of the greatest myths I encounter daily around here is how Civil War soldiers stood out in the open and just shot each other from 50 or 100 feet away. Well, that just didn't happen. They were digging long before 1864. The plan, once again, was to leave. This was just a delay. By 2 p.m., evacuation orders were in place. The U.S. Army would pull out at 6 p.m. Fountain Branch Carter, right there, shows him just before the war. He was 67 years old on November 30th, and this was his home. So if the military part of this isn't terribly interesting to you or might be a little confusing, imagine if this was your house. And there is nothing over which you have control. Everything has been ripped out of your control. You're relying on a stranger's advice about whether you should even stay. His oldest son, Moscow, here at the top. Moscow's here. The youngest son on the lower right, Francis, he's in a POW camp at this stage down in New Orleans. And then there's the one on the lower left, Todd Carter. Anyone know where he was? Confederate Army. He's in the Confederate Army. Heading this way. I haven't seen him for three and a half years. Todd had been captured at Chattanooga, escaped from a POW camp in Ohio, made his way south, but not to go home. He rejoined the Southern Army. And about one o'clock that afternoon, not long after Fountain Branch in Moscow had talked to Jacob Cox in the room we just left, the Southern Army starts arriving on the south edge of Franklin. All afternoon, John Bell Hood's troops deployed into line of battle. It took them about two and a half hours to unwind. <clears throat> By 3.30, there were nearly 20,000 rebel troops out there stretched across a front that was two miles from one end to the other. It was an incredible sight. And no one quite knew what was about to happen. It's a beautiful day. It was about 58, 59 that afternoon. It's unusually cold right now. <laughs> it was clear, no wind. And these two armies are just looking at each other across about two miles of open farmland. And John Bell Hood had a decision to make that sometimes commanding generals have to make. It's the decision that is the hard one. Because the easy decision is to do nothing. The hard decision is to commit your men to an engagement such as this. He 
decided to attack. He believed this was his last chance to destroy John Schofield's army before it got away again and got to Nashville. Interestingly enough, unknown to either Hood or Schofield, boats have begun to arrive at Nashville carrying the first troops of the 16th Corps. The reinforcements had finally gotten there, but destiny was about to play out here. Anyone ever read Intruders in the Dust by William Faulkner? Faulkner once wrote that every southern boy could imagine himself on the fields of Gettysburg just before Pickett's charge began. I have never for the life of me figured out how Faulkner, who was from Mississippi, forgot about Franklin, considering about a quarter of the men out there were from Mississippi. But he, like most, did. They chose to focus on other battles. When maybe it seemed like there was still a chance from the Confederate perspective. There are men from every state in the Old South out there, but Virginia and North Carolina. A lot of Tennesseans, Texans, guys from Georgia and Alabama, South Carolina, Arkansas. Guys on this side from Illinois, Ohio, and Indiana. They're the bulk of this army but some troops from Missouri, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. These two sides don't like each other. Don't ever kid yourself. By 1864, these two sides hate each other. One side completely dedicated to the preservation of the Union, above all, and one side willing to fight to the last, believing their cause was just and right. Four o'clock that afternoon, 20,000 Southern troops begin to move in this direction, in unison. One of the single largest infantry assaults of the entire Civil War, far bigger than Pickett's charge at Gettysburg, far bigger. And those who saw it could not believe what they received. There are a multitude of accounts. Men on this side were just dumbstruck by just the spectacle. Many described the sounds. One said it sounded like distant summer thunder rumbling up in the distance. One said it reminded him of the first time he heard a locomotive. He said you could feel it. You could hear it before you could see it. One man not far on the other side of the road said he was struck by the silence punctuated by two things, the sound of men breathing and the clicking of the rifle hammers as they waited. And about 4.15, all hell broke loose. And it was then that the Carters realized there was nowhere to go. And that's when Moscow and the girls in Fountain Branch gathered up the kids as quick as they could and they fled for what they hoped would be the safety of the rooms beneath us, as 40,000 men would engage in, in really, truthfully, combat that is as bad as combat could possibly be. I will warn you, there is no happy ending to this story. And the combat that I will describe to some of you will be as graphic as it can possibly be. Not because I'll make it that way, because it was. It shocked the veterans. It completely shocked them. They could not believe what they experienced here. So that's going to lead us outside. Anyone have any questions? Now's your chance. Ask away. If you've never been, or if you've been before, something you might have heard, now's your chance. Were there any Florida troops here? That were. It was a... Uh, called himself the Florida Brigade. They were commanded here by Robert Bullock. Jesse Finley had been their commander, but he'd been wounded. The Bullock's guys are way out to the west. Are you coming back in here at all? Into this building, into the house? I wasn't planning on it. Well, I read that there was this iron casket that belonged
belong to General Shy that was on display at least at one point in this house? Um, it was never in the house. It was in the museum for many years. It's actually on, uh, it's part of the exhibit at Carlton right now. Oh, it's at Colonel William Shy was a member of Todd Carter's regiment, 20th Tennessee. Shy was killed, of course, on what was known as Compton's Hill, and then became known as Shy's Hill in his casket. Uh, it's, it's quite something. That story in and of itself, how his body was dug up 115 years after he was, after he was killed, it's quite a story. She, she read it to us on the bus. <laughs> they thought it was a murder for a few days. <laughs> They found out he'd been shot in the forehead at point blank range by a 36 caliber Colt Navy many years before that. Was there any discussion by the senior officers on either side of the strategic value, should the Confederacy be successful, of in fact taking uh, the city? I guess I don't understand your question. In other words, the, the purpose of Hood is to take the city. Take, take Nashville. Nashville. Is there any discussion of the strategic value of taking Nashville at this point after Lincoln had already been elected? On the Confederate side. On the Confederate side. Well, that's a very good question. This campaign begins before the election. And so by the time of the election, the campaign is so far down the road to stop at that point was just not an option. And this was whose decision would it be to stop them or do something like Jefferson that. Davis. Yeah. And that's where I was going to go. Soldiers follow orders. The commander-in-chief wasn't ready to surrender. And that's just a plain and simple fact. The armies couldn't just stop. Well, I guess they could, and they'd call that mutiny. The commander-in-chief, well, he didn't want to stop in mid-April 1865. Um, he was absolutely convinced they could win, right up until the bitter end. This house, did it, uh, it must have provided the protection that the family hoped it would? It did. It was damaged as well as the buildings around it, but yes, the family, the all family got through it. Survived. They did. Except for Todd, right. who would be terribly injured in the fighting war. Probably finish up the tour with some <clears throat> with some talk about him. Are Any other still questions? bullet holes visible on the building outside or anything? There's one right there on the left side of that little window sill, but they're all over outside. In, in a constitutional sense, what do the senior officers do when the commander in chief is delusional? I have to be careful answering that question. <laughs> Not in modern times to think that. <laughs> I think that, I, I don't think Jefferson Davis was the only one who thought that way. You didn't get that point. You couldn't get them to continue to fight unless they really believed it. Now Davis carries on the delusion, I think, a little bit longer than most. But let's face it, even Robert E. Lee broke out of the lines at Petersburg nine days before Appomattox, and he actually thinks he can get away, limping across Virginia like a wounded animal. He actually thought he could get away. They had him surrounded on three sides at Appomattox when Grant first sent him the request to consult about a surrender, and Lee refused. It wasn't until he was boxed in on the fourth side that he finally quit. He, didn't, he wasn't convinced that Union soldiers would pursue it if they didn't get it. Mm -hmm. uh, is it realistic that Hood could have flanked Franklin and not fought there? I don't believe so. No. I don't believe so. It's a topic I covered in my first book. There were 5,000 cavalry east of the river guarding the high ground where the fords were, and there were 5,000 infantry north of the river, right where the factory is, where the state event unfolded this morning. There is no way, in my opinion, that Nathan Bedford Forrest and his cavalry were ever going to get around the flank of Schofield's army. The problem wasn't getting across the river. The problem was what you were going to do when you got on the other side. And he found out very quickly that the federal cavalry was a potent force and shoved him right back across to this side of the river. 
Contrary to what some in the South think, Forrest was not immortal. He was a human being. Um, oh, I first read about Franklin when I was probably one of the first couple Civil War books I ever picked up. It also didn't, ha didn't hurt that I, I gravitated toward the Western battles. I had a cousin who was just obsessed with Gettysburg and Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson. And I got so sick of hearing about that. <laughs> <laughs> I was more interested in Shiloh and Vicksburg and Atlanta, and then I read about Franklin and uh, in Nashville. And, and so I just sort of moved in that direction because I believe the war, and I could probably have a good long discussion about the merits of it, the war was won and the war was lost in the West not in the East, which sends Eastern theater folks into orbit, and you would think their heads are going to explode. I don't think battles like Gettysburg accomplished a damn thing, to be honest with you. I think the real battles that resulted in the termination of the war were Shiloh, Vicksburg, Atlanta, Chattanooga. They were crippling defeats from which the Confederacy never recovered. And the ultimate conquerors, on the Union side, the Federal side, the U.S. side, named Grant and Sherman. And where did they come from? The West. So the war in the West did go East. Robert E. Lee was just fighting a delaying action out there, I think, ultimately all along. And once Robert E. Lee actually faced off against somebody who had some merit, he wasn't quite the same. I think I might have been able to beat George McClellan on a good day. <laughs> That's no great accomplishment. <clears throat> so, that's. I just gravitated this way, and it also helped that I grew up around a lot of World War II and Korea vets. And uh, especially the Korea guys had a great impact on me. Most people my age and younger couldn't find Korea on a map. And they had done some amazing things, and everybody had forgotten about them. And I was struck by the same story of the men who fought here. Nobody knew about what they'd done. Once again, it was Lee, it was Jackson, it was Gettysburg, it was Grant, it was this, it was that, it was the same old stuff. But what about what happened out here? Can't trust the press. All they ever did was cover the East, forgot about the West. So it kind of moved me this way and brought me down here, which is really just gorgeous country. I'd encourage you all to move, but yeah. <laughs> I like it quiet and not overpopulated. I'll be a great person for it. We should go outside, I suppose. Yeah. Hello, Miss Craddock. One last question. Yeah. What would you say regarding John Bell Hood's use of laudanum as uh, it relates to his decision making? He didn't take any laudanum. I thought he did. He did not. Oh, it's an old know. story. Oh, really? Myth and legend. Because of his amputation, I thought. Not one single bit of evidence that John Bell Hood was doing anything more than the average person is doing. Okay. Was he physically limited? Obviously, he was. Old stories. Okay. Old stories that were concocted, I think, largely to explain what happened at Spring Hill, because people couldn't wrap their arms around the fact that they could actually make such a colossal screw up and let the whole Yankee army get away. So somebody had to be on drugs. <laughs> or somebody had to be drinking, or there had to be a woman involved. So it was like the trifecta of trouble that was created. <laughs>
50th Ohio is to their left. We did an archaeological dig once the site was cleared. So now we know exactly where the line was. And it was exactly where the map said it was. And there was a lot of interesting stuff that came out of the dig. Right behind us is part of what was known as the secondary line. That was manned by the 44th Missouri. That was a unit that had never been in combat. They had just arrived in Tennessee on November 27th. They had just been attached to the Army. So we talked a little bit about the Confederate perspective, but let me just give you one last piece on the U.S. Army perspective, or the U.S. Army layout. This is a section of the main line. The main line runs back in that direction. By the way, we have these two properties under contract. Our purpose is to buy them. $2.8 million. So if you'd like to contribute, let me know, because we need to get the money by the 31st, but we're going to get it. In fact, just this morning, the Civil War Trust announced they're putting in $200,000 toward this project. We need to raise about a million. That's where the math is right now. And we've got about 400,000 of that, so we really need about $600,000 more. But we're going to get it, and that's going to be open space, and we'll have another section of the field. But this line shoots off in that direction and out to the northwest. This secondary line was created at around noon. Jacob Cox, who again is headquartered at the Carter House, wanted a secondary line of defense. He didn't want earthworks, and those troops eventually, that's a, that's a recreated perk, that's not original. They began to throw up earthworks. Cox did not want that. He wanted the reserve troops to easily be able to support the main line. But nonetheless, they threw up some slight earthworks. The last US unit to arrive in Franklin was a division commanded by George Wagner. George Wagner's troops had been the first in to Spring Hill the day before, and they were the last to leave. They left Spring Hill at 5 AM on November 30th. They have been the rear guard of the army all the way up from Spring Hill. They have been fending off forest cavalry the whole way up from Spring Hill. When he gets here, if you look across the terrain, when we leave, you will see that while the ground out here is open and roughly flat, it really isn't flat. There are rolls. I mean, you can see this ridge. A half mile south of here, there's a pretty pronounced ridge that bisects the main road. You can't see from this area beyond that ridge very well. Wagner's orders were discretionary. So he places his troops on that ridge. His intent, as it seems, was to monitor Confederate movements or developments beyond the ridge. He commands three brigades. He places one brigade on this side of the main road. He places another brigade on that side. 1,500 or so men on each side. He orders the third brigade to continue the line on this side. That brigade commander was a fellow named Emerson Updike. If you've read anything about Franklin, you might have heard of Updike. Updike was difficult on his best days. <laughs> And he and Wagner and everyone in the army are exhausted. Unlike the Confederates who spent much of the night sleeping, the US troops have been on the move all night. Updike thought these orders were nonsensical and refused to place his brigade on that ridge. And he marched his troops right up the road, right past the house, and down into a hollow that's about 200 yards north of here. They broke ranks, started to make coffee, cook food, catch a break. And here come 20,000 Southern troops. <laughs> now, imagine if you're one of the roughly 3,000 men out on this advance line. You're watching seven times your number come right at you. For them, the threat wasn't so much what was right in front of them. It was the fact that they're completely overlapped on the flanks. And they put up a fight. The first significant casualties of the battle are inflicted out on that ridge. But eventually, they broke. And when the break occurred, it was sudden. In fact, John Schellenberger was an Ohio officer out there who said that it was like a powder train that had been lit. Just, just the whole thing just implodes. And there are a good five, six, seven hundred of those men who are killed, captured, or wounded. But you have well in excess of 2,000 that are now flooding back toward this area, racing for their lives. And this grand, broad Confederate attack morphs into a full-on charge. 
This was part of Hood's intent. When Hood made the decision to attack, he could see that advanced line. What advantage does that advanced line offer the Confederates? A shield. A screen. A shield yeah. or a screen. Because if I wanted to break through here, and I put a few people here, and I push them back into that line, what sort of dilemma does, as those troops are coming back in this direction, what, for example, <coughs> cannot the 72nd Illinois do? Shoot. Because they have their own men between them and the enemy. This was the Confederate attempt to use that advanced line as a shield, but this involves speed, and every minute counts. You use them as a shield, and then you use them as a wedge, and you hammer it right into the middle of the center of the line. Remember, this is sort of a half-shaped moon sort of creation, half of an arc. It's great to move troops back and forth across the flanks because the distance is reduced, but where's the weakness of a position that's like a half arc? It's weak in the center. Because if you get enemy troops, remember, look at the direction of this line. This line goes right off the corner of that building and out through the parking lot, out in that direction. If you get enemy troops up into this area, they're gonna start shooting those guys in the back. So you break the army, you split it in half, and then you start hammering the flanks from the rear. You roll up the whole US Army. And there's a river back there. There's no easy escape. I know from this distance of time, people would say, why did they attack like this? Why did they attack like this? These sorts of frontal assaults. Well, we were still doing it in World War II. When we threw tens of thousands of troops on the beaches at Normandy, sometimes you have to put human muscle in place to break the enemy. You're not fighting a group of 100 guys that are going to scatter if you hit them with a few bombs. You got to get in there with big numbers. You have to. Sometimes you just have to. And so what happens at around 4.30 as these troops are flooding back to this area, the main line can't fire and there is this incredible cataclysm in the center. And the whole center of the U.S. defensive perimeter buckles and falls back. Moscow Carter, who knew this ground as well as anyone, said by his estimate the breach in the main line was 200 yards from one end to the other. Let me tell you, that's a big hole. That's two football fields, lengthwise. And you have Confederate troops flooding into the interior. The 72nd Illinois falls back. The 50th Ohio is obliterated. Half the men are gone in minutes. Killed, wounded, captured. Across the road, two more Ohio units fall back. On this secondary line is a brand new regiment and there's another brand new regiment on the other side of the road. What's so compelling about their story, not just their place on the field, they've never been under fire. And one of the things I learned in talking to veterans for so many years, is I always had these, I was the kind of guy that would ask anything. And I was always interested about the first time under fire. And it's amazing what a timeless experience that is. It doesn't matter what war it is. Everyone can relate to you who's been in combat that story, and they are so consistent, that first, that time you realize, the first time, that it's for real. It's for real. Somebody's trying to kill you, mm -hmm. repeatedly. And not all new troops handle pressure like that well. Somehow, these guys held the line when they watch the veterans right in front of them get absolutely blown up. This regiment alone suffered almost a third of its number as casualties. Killed, wounded, captured, the Confederates get right up on those works, but they can't break through. This is all so condensed in a tour like this because something like this, you could really, you could really spend hours talking about it. There are three phases of this battle that play out, not simultaneously, but with a lot of overlap. There's a furious counter-assault on the east side of the road. U.S. troops, including one of those new regiments, push the Confederates back. And there's this holding action. 
in my opinion, what happens over there, and if we had time, we'd go, but we don't, so you have to do that on your own if you're staying around or come back another time, and this. The edges of the breakthrough are the anchor points. They're the keys. Because everything is just completely being destroyed in front of you and to your left. So when do you run? When do you run? When do you fall back? When does the instinct to not die kick in? And with some soldiers, it never does, and they just hold their ground. Mm -hmm. One of the men in that regiment say, said the Johnnies came at us 11 times in 45 minutes. 11 separate waves of them in 45 minutes. We've been together about 45 minutes. Imagine fighting for your life 11 times. <clears throat> the fighting degenerates into an all-out brawl. They were knocking the Confederates back with picks, axes, spades, shovels. They're using the butt end of the musket. Forget about the bayonet. You use everything else you've got. They're holding them back any possible way. They're all over them, howling, screaming. The sun sets, well, it's 3.05. That sun goes down at 4.35. It's dark by five. There's no moon in the sky. This is all happening at about 4.30 and 4.45 in the twilight, this furious action. These die-hard Confederates, the ones who haven't deserted, throwing themselves wave after wave after wave, and they're trying to punch through. I was training someone a few weeks ago, a new guy, we do battlefield tours, and we were talking about the time. Because what name haven't I mentioned now for a little bit, the one who disobeyed the orders? Update. 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 Yeah, because he's two football fields that way, facing north. It's going to take him a few minutes to get turned around, get moved up here. Now, Updike, to the day he died, said he saved the whole army. <laughs> Did it all by himself. His men, his unit, all by themselves. He didn't, but he thought he did. So I was talking to this new guy about this amount of time. Three, four, five minutes at the most. And time has this amazing ability to warp. It can go fast, it can go slow. We've all experienced that. You know, it's like when the Vikings are two minutes left in the fourth quarter. And it's very long. Like that game against the Bills. The TV almost went out the window. I thought there's only one team in the NFL that can do this consistently over decades, and it's the Minnesota Vikings. I don't even know why I cheer for them anymore. Oh, they just drive me crazy. So time slows down. So I was talking to this guy, because, you know, it just doesn't seem like a lot of time. So I'll tell you a story. I used to run a business. Started a business when I was in my early 20s. Ran it for almost 15 years. Way too many employees by the time I left. We were, we were really good at what we did. And I said, this is too big, and I'm leaving. I'm going to Tennessee. <laughs> but somehow I got to thinking about something I had done to someone once. And he was a nice kid, but he couldn't get to work on time. He couldn't get to work to save <laughs> his life. He was constantly, every day, five minutes late. <coughs> and I told him, you're late. I know. Next day, you're late again. I know. This went on for like two weeks. Finally, one day, I said, you know, I'm going to try something just for fun because I, I was just in the mood that morning because he's a nice guy and I wasn't going to fire him for being five minutes late. It's really starting to get on my nerves. And so I said, Tom, come here and sit down. So he knows it's not going to be good because he's been late every day. And I said, you're late again. He said, I know. And I said, I told you to leave early. Don't leave early, you're still late. I said, I don't know how to fix this, but I'm gonna try one last thing. And he said, oh, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna fire me? I said, no, I'm not gonna fire you. It's gonna be worse than that. <coughs> I said, we are gonna sit here, and we're gonna look at each other. We're gonna stare into each other's eyes for five minutes. <laughs> And you're going to see how long five minutes can be. Because when you're late every day, it's going fast. You're trying to get to work. But for me, I'm sitting there, and it's going on forever. So I'm going to give you my experience, and we're going to sit here, and we're just going to look into each other's eyes. We're not going to move. We're not going to talk. We're just going to look at each other. He lasted about a minute and 30 seconds. He's like, I get it. I get it. Because oh, it took forever. He wasn't late again after that. So I was telling this story to Kevin, the new guy. Time has this incredible ability, depending on whatever situation you're in, to 
move slowly or move quickly. And for these men, various descriptions were they it went by in a flash. For some, they said it just dragged on interminably. Each man in the, in the same situation felt it differently. But time, of course, we know doesn't warp, at least unless you're in you know, the new movie Interstellar, and then it kind of does. But here it doesn't. It's constant. What they did was they bought three to five minutes of precious time. They had taken the breach and they had sealed off the edges of it and they held it in check, holding on for dear life. But there's still a break in the middle. So let's walk right up here quickly. This is where the battle's apex is reached. So I've mentioned what happens on the two ends of the breakthrough. And, and by the way, when we get to Carnton, we're gonna cover this, there is just furious fighting further to the east and further to the west. But out there, the Confederates are just walking into a buzzsaw and taking horrendous casualties, but are not able to penetrate the US position. This is where they had a chance. And this is where the door would be slammed shut on them. There's still a section of the line that's ripped open. This cabin was not here. It was a four-gun battery, 20th Ohio. Right up, two of the guns are right about where those two are. The other two would have been right here. These guns are contested. The Confederates never get them, but the Federal gunners can't really utilize them. In fact, one of the Federal gunners a fellow named Alonzo Wolverton said they were knocking the rebels back with sponge staves and hand spikes. This is a hand-to-hand -hand fight. And there's another myth about the Civil War. There really isn't that much hand-to-hand, -hand, sustained hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Franklin, once they got engaged, virtually most of the battle for the better part of a couple of hours is hand-to-hand. -hand. But there's still about a 75-yard gap from these guns to these little buildings and then beyond that little clapboard one. So Confederates are streaming through this area. They're coming between the two buildings, vaulting the garden gate. They're flooding around the other side of the building. Now they're going around the house. And if you don't seal off this breach, all the work that's being done in those other two areas is going to be irrelevant because they can still accomplish the same thing. You still have an avenue to keep forcing troops through. You have to seal it. So there's one unit left on the field. And where are they? That's where Updike's at. Updike's men are veterans. You did not have to tell them what to do. They could hear this ferocious growling explosion up at the top of the hill. But notice what the ground does. See? It dives down. They can't see it. They can only hear it. But the Confederates also couldn't see them either. A Tennessean who hit this area said it looked like they were coming out of the ground. <laughs> because when Updike's roughly 1,500 men started flooding in this direction, three of his regiments support the efforts over there. The other four slam into this sector. Now, this isn't a Minnesota story, but it's close. The 24th Wisconsin was here. The 24th Wisconsin was commanded by a 19-year-old major. They had left Milwaukee two and a half years before. The only thing I could hold against them is they probably today would be Packer fans. But <laughs> still a great unit. They got to Franklin after having left home with a thousand. They got here with 150 and commanded by a major. His name was Arthur MacArthur. Most of you today know who his son was, Douglas MacArthur. Arthur was wounded several times and almost died. His men found him, dragged him off the field, saved his life. 20 years after the war is when Douglas was born. That story, I think, is so great because it shows how history pivots on the slightest of things. We often talk about people who die. You know, one that just immediately comes to mind is John F. Kennedy or Martin Luther King. What would have happened had they lived? Well, what would have happened had MacArthur died? There would be no Douglas MacArthur. How does that impact World War II? Well, in a very tangible way. Don't know that it changes the outcome, but it sure changes a lot of stuff going on in the South Pacific. 
Updike's men come roaring into this area. Those who saw it said it looked like two ocean waves mm. crashing together. A man in the 44th Missouri said he glanced to his left and he could hear this sickening sound of flesh, bone, steel, and wood crashing together. They met in some places on a full run. And they forcibly shoved the Confederates back out beyond these buildings, out into the garden in that area. Now, everything I have described to you has happened by just before 5 o'clock. The, the battle is barely an hour old. But the Confederates will not relent. And they continue to pour men into the, into the breach. Reserve troops move up in the darkness. And this fight would drag on at close quarters for hours. A Mississippian said they just began to shoot us down like animals trapped in a pen. You had southern troops out in that area that were piling the bodies of the dead around them to prevent themselves from being killed. Aaron Baldwin, Baldwin was an artilleryman on the other side of the road who said they were firing into the Confederates. And every time they fired, you could hear this sound. He said it reminded him of gigantic branches being ripped from a tree. You know that sickening sound during a storm when wood starts to twist and snap? Baldwin said that's what the bones of southern troops sounded like as they fired in and they were just blowing holes through the advancing columns. One of the Confederate units on that side of the field, the Missouri Brigade, suffered 60% casualties on a brigade level. That is catastrophic. There are six Confederate generals down. Dozens of regimental and brigade commanders are down. The rank and file is just being torn apart but they will not stop. They keep coming again and again and again in the darkness. What they did not seem to realize was the door had been effectively shut off. Even Jacob Cox said prisoners were expressing amazement at the strength of our position after the initial breakthrough. Once it got dark, I think all the way up to Hood, they never realized how quickly their opportunity had been ripped away from them. And so they kept feeding into this monster. And on the darker side of Franklin, there was plenty that went on that night after dark that would not be much to write home about. The wanton killing of prisoners. A US soldier said, the more of them we kill, the less we have to send to POW camps. The sooner this war will be over. Once the US Army got them down on the ground, in some ways, they went for the kill. But the Southerners still would not quit. And you have these two sides grappling here in ways that, as I said earlier, shocked even the veterans. It begins to finally flame out at around 7.30, 8 o'clock. It's over by 9. By the time it ended, there were nearly 10,000 casualties. It is essentially, Franklin, the first half of Antietam. 10,000 casualties in five hours. There were about 22 or 2,300 killed. About 7,000 were wounded. 1,000 were captured. Many would later die in POW camps. Think about the number 7,000 wounded for a minute. There's a little town back there of 750. 10 times the population of the town. No policemen, no firemen, no Red Cross, no help. The US Army pulled out that night, went to Nashville, left their dead on the field and some of the wounded, evacuated, went north. It was what was left of the Southern Army and the civilians who had to deal with the after effects of it. The Southern Army buried the dead the next day and then moved on to Nashville and invested the city. And I think in many ways just <clears throat> waited for the inevitable, waited for the hammer to fall. Because you couldn't go back. You couldn't go back, not willingly. You had to go back forced by the enemy. That's where the war was at at this stage. They had the initiative. They were going to go to Nashville. They were going to get there one way or another. And they weren't going to turn around until the enemy shoved them the other way. And that enemy, those U.S. troops, did. They came out on the 15th and the 16th 
And I cannot tell you, I wish I was going to be there on Sunday because to see the troops from my home state commemorated in an area where, to speak very frankly, I hear a lot of nonsense and garbage about how federal troops are viewed by some of the hangers on as invaders, as murderers. They saved the Union. And to see those men commemorated for what they did on that hill in pushing these Confederate troops back and preserving that Union um, makes me incredibly proud because I have never been one to pick sides in this war. I can find plenty of good and bad on both sides. We were all Americans, and everyone on this level, I won't give a pass to some of the politicians who caused this war. But to the rank and file who fought on both sides, who had, to, who had to fight here and who had to fight there. I mean, gosh, some people think it's cold today. <laughs> Should have been sitting outside Nashville on 10th, 11th, and 12th of December, 1864, when it barely got 20 degrees. Down to almost zero at night. When the guys from Ohio were complaining about how cold it was, imagine how the ones in lower Alabama must have felt. <laughs> but to see to see this commemoration, to see this monument go up on that hill, I love it. There should be more of it. I wish there was a state, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, that would do that here. I would hope that maybe this would encourage them to do that. Because for visitors to really get perspective is to get the perspective of both sides, not just one, to get both sides. I describe this as the last major battle of the war. Nashville was bigger, much broader troop movements. So when I describe it as the last major battle, I'm really referring to the casualties. Because Nashville had, if you added in the prisoners, quite a lot. But the Army of Tennessee, the Confederate Army, its spirit died here. What was left on the hills outside of Nashville was something to be finished off. Its best commanders and some of its best troops never left this town. And then it was all over just two weeks later. This family, as you'll see at Carnton, were forever impacted. In the middle of the night, the Carter family would learn that their son and brother had been badly wounded. Todd was found a few hours later down in the low ground to the southwest. They brought him back. He died in the house in which he was raised on December 2nd. I have told Todd Carter's story for years, but I believe in my heart of hearts that his story is as much about his father as it is about him. Because I cannot imagine what that poor man went through that night having to go look for his boy. And any of you who are parents, like me, you never forget when your kids are that big. And I cannot imagine what this poor man went through especially as someone who'd seen war do terrible things to his state and his community, and then to lose his son. At the end, you see how some people grow to hate it, war, really hate it. And the people of this generation grew to hate it. They went to rebuilding the country. It took a long time. But I said this morning, I think the greatest testament to those who survived this awful conflict, they didn't fight it again. I love when it, we just had an election. I love when I hear people today say, we've never been so divided. <laughs> I'm like, really? <laughs> really? Pick up a book and read about 1860 or 1861. We have been far more divided. The Founders never intended for us to always get along and compromise on everything. The Founders, in fact, sometimes wanted us to have it out and really argue and stand up for principle, but not have a civil war. We did that once. Here we are 150 years later. If you haven't been here, thanks for visiting the first time. If you have, you have to come back again. But there's one last place that I'm going to send you to. And you're going to go on your own, because this isn't part of my tour. I stopped taking people to this spot years ago. 
Some of you probably know where it's at. Walk that way, go between those two buildings. You will see bullet holes all over those buildings. When you get between them, turn around and look at the south walls. They're believed to be the most damaged buildings still standing from the Civil War. And I don't take people there for this simple reason. I go there myself. It's not like I avoid it. I just don't take groups. There are some places that are meant to be quiet places of reflection. And I believe that that's what that place is. No amount of my chattering is going to add to that experience. Walk through and just look at it. Take a photo, talk amongst yourselves, but look at it. And it, it'll maybe give you a different perspective on if you think you've had a bad day. <laughs> There are people in places like that. Pearl Harbor. I lost a relative on 9-11. There are worse days. <laughs>